<laughs> so hi everyone. Um, I think we're going to get started now. Um, thanks for joining us today for our webinar entitled Dirty Money in Canadian Housing. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the different lands on which we gather. For me now, it is the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat, and the people of the Mississauga of the Credit, who have nurtured, loved, and lived on this land since time immemorial. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to create, collaborate, live, and work on this land, and commit to do my best to care for it as a guest here. Wherever you may be joining us from, I encourage you to share your own acknowledgement in the chat. So, hi, I'm Claire Dreyfus, and I'm part of the ECHO Expert Community on Housing team here at CMHC. Our exciting webinar today is a collaboration between ECHO and CHEC, the Canadian Housing Evidence Collaborative. And you will hear from Jim Dunn, our moderator today, just after me. We have four presenters today. First off, we have Mark Lokinen, an associate professor and data strategist at Royal Roads University. Mark is a qualified financial crime expert and a leading national voice on financial forensics and anti-money laundering compliance. Next is Sam Cooper, an investigative journalist for Global News. He reports on various issues such as organized crime and foreign influence in our national landscape. Following is Dr. Maureen Maloney, a professor in the School of Public Policy at Simon Fraser, Un Simon Fraser University. Along with her history of serving the public as Deputy Minister to the Attorney General of BC, Deputy Eternal, she was Chair of the Expert Panel on Combating Money Laundering in Real Estate in British Columbia. <laughs> Finally, we have Stephen Schneider, an Associate Professor in the Department of Criminology at St. Mary's University. He holds a wealth of knowledge in the areas of organized crime and crime prevention, along with authoring several publications, including his recent book, Canadian Organized Crime. Both of the links to where you can find their books can be found in the chat in a little bit. So before we begin, I just have a few notes I'd like to remind attendees. We'll have about 20, 25 minutes at the end of the presentation to discuss. Therefore, please, if you have any questions or comments during the presentation, drop them into the chat and we look forward to discussing afterwards. Our webinars are member driven, therefore the words and opinions expressed by the presenters are entirely their own. We encourage you to connect with the presenters after the webinar. Their emails will be posted in the chat and there will be a follow up email with possible unanswered questions and the presenters info sent to all attendees after the event. After the webinar, if you have further questions or would like to know more, please email us at innovationresearch at cmhc-schl gc.ca. That email address will also be posted in the chat. If you can mute your mics and turn off your cameras, that'd be appreciated so that we can hear and see the presenters clearly. If you are joining us through the phone and are muted, press star six to unmute during our discussion period. This event will be recorded and will be uploaded onto the Echo platform in the next few days. Echo is a platform for collaboration, networking, and knowledge sharing across the housing realm. If you would like to know more or are not yet a member and would like to become one, the link to sign up will be posted in the chat. We have a lot of great content from past reports and the opportunity to connect with many housing professionals, only accessible to members, and some exciting webinars coming down the pipeline. Tomorrow, we have a webinar on revitalizing tower communities in the GTA. And on March 22nd, we have our exciting ECHO rental housing event, where members will have the opportunity to interact with presenters in breakout rooms afterwards. Stay tuned, the invitation for the event will be sent out to ECHO members by midweek. Please, as more info will be posted on ECHO in the coming weeks for all our April webinars. Thank you all again for joining us today, and we look forward to hearing from you and your thoughts and questions on the presentation. So over to you, Jim. Thanks so much, Claire, and welcome everyone. I'm joining you from the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations with lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. To say that is to acknowledge a debt to those who were here before us and recognize our responsibility as guests to respect and honor the intimate relationship Indigenous peoples have to this land. And I want to thank you for joining today's event, the Canadian Housing Evidence Collaborative's first webinar collaboration with CMHC on the ECO platform. And it's clear from today's event that there's a real desire to learn more about housing and discuss solutions for Canada's housing crisis. I hope this is the first of many such events. Cynthia from my team is going to uh, put our various web handles in the chat so that you can follow us and find out about what CHECK is up to. 
Now, I don't want to take too much time away from our presenters. Uh, I'd like to get right into it, uh, but I do want to give a little bit of the context for uh, for the presentations and the, the panel today. Um, you know, there's a widespread understanding, at least at a superficial level, that money laundering is a big issue in Canada. And in fact, Canada may be a preferential destination for such activities. And it also is, again, superficially known that this is somehow involved in increasing housing prices and potentially in the housing crisis itself. And so uh, I think the key thing is that the, this isn't a problem necessarily of offshore accounts in sunny places, those matter too, but this is actually on our doorstep and it's causing artificially high price bubbles in real estate. It's believed to be one of the reasons that people in Canada can't afford safe and decent housing and hopefully our panelists will be able to shed a light on just how much of an influence it is. Uh, it's a problem that has so many different parts and different players and it made sense to bring together experts from different fields, from academia, from government, and journalism and take a deep dive or as deep as we can get in 90 minutes to throw a light on this threat so we can understand it and rectify it and also identify new research priorities because that's uh, our mission at CHECK. So I want to turn it over now to our first speaker who is uh, Dr. Mark Lokanen from Royal Roads University. Take it away, Mark. Thank you, Jim. Um, I just want to say I'm privileged and honored to be speaking to you from the unceded territory of the semi-animal force nation people. Can you um, enlarge that uh, theory? OK, right. So thank you very much. Um, this project is uh, part of a larger project, two part project on uh, the accounting profession in the fight against money laundering in Canada. And um, so the first part of this project is we are planning to build. Uh, we are actually building a machine learning and artificial intelligence model to predict accounting misconduct. And the second part of the project, which I'm presenting on today, is where we, have, we, we, we are conducting over 40 interviews with key stakeholders in Canada. So this, this portion of the, of the presentation is based on the preliminary findings of 17 interviews that we have so far collected. Next slide, please. Right, so by way of an agenda, uh, quickly uh, go through um, the introduction followed by context where I talked about some of the methodology used, um, the problems that the accounting profession is currently experiencing, followed by some recommendations and questions at the end. Next slide, please. Right, so like any other professions, legal, uh, securities, industry, insurance, um, notaries, and so on, accountants does have a role to play in combating uh, money laundering in Canada and by Border extension internationally. Next slide, please. Now, very important here is that there are lots of methods that are being used, but from the interviews that we've collected so far, four predominant methods are currently being used within within the Canadian uh, sector. The first two are basically self-explanatory: you purchase and selling of properties, or assisting in the purchase and selling of properties. But the other two for me was quite surprising, especially the third one, assessing financial institutions. So what we have found here is that there seems to be a network of individuals working together across institutions. And this is a tiny proportion of individuals who, try, who, who you know, in, in various ways, shape or form, facilitate or integrate uh, these transactions in, into the economy. And then the safe methods one is also very interesting so basically what that is is you you get a regular mortgage you pay up like seven to eight payments and all of a sudden you see a lump sum payment comes in to clear up the principal next slide please these activities of course uh triggers sorry um clear accounts I can't see the slide. Oh, you can't see it? Sorry. No. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Uh, can you see it now? I uh, No. <laughs> yep, here you go. So yeah, those uh, methodologies, of course, uh, have triggering activities related to them, such as suspicious transaction, terrorist properties, and, and large cash transactions. So in terms of accounting, really, the areas that we have to deal with it is exceptionally small. So it makes you wonder what exactly are these problems? Like, why are we facing these problems within the profession? Next slide, please. Next slide, please. 
Right. So what are some of these problems? Well, <laughs> interestingly enough, um, among at least from my perspective, the, the, the main issue here is that if you talk to accountants, they have very limited knowledge of what exactly they have to do, what exactly they have to disclose. So there seems to be a fundamental misunderstanding of their disclosing requirements. Another thing we have to understand here is that accounting, <coughs> accounting firms at every level really, um, except perhaps the larger big firms that put more emphasis on this, don't really understand or know the rules that have to be enforced. For some of them, they're, they perhaps have never uh, opened the, the guidelines to the, 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 the PCMLA guidelines to these different acts. Um, and uh, another thing, uh, again, that's, that, that came out in interviews is that the confidentiality agreement between uh, the clients and the accounting firms prevent them from reporting suspicious transactions to track, And that also came out in um, some of the documents that we have read over from, print, from print track, print track as well. Next slide, please. In uh, 2014, and I think there are various uh, different variations of the, the P, uh, CPA Act Guide to Comply, there's been um, some problems with this because if you look at, if you look at, go across the different uh, provincial um, accounting bodies, you would see that the, this this act is, the guidelines is not really being followed, right? So each accounting forms uh, operate on an individual basis. And so if you think about it really in layman terms, I mean, if an accountant who is complicit in, in, in laundering proceeds of crime, um, you know, for whichever form he or she is working from, it's highly unlikely that that person would report that 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 transaction, report suspicious transaction to the, to to to, to fit track or any other regulatory bodies. And another key distinction here as well is that, as most of you probably will know, the accounting profession in Canada is very fragmented. We have different. Uh, provincial bodies. We have CPA Canada, yes, but there are different provincial associations, so hence that in itself also hinders reporting uh, at a national level. Next slide. Perhaps more perplexing is that the, the, the current Proceeds of Crime Act does not really cover all accountants. So again, if you look at this act, it specifically talked about CMA, CGA, and uh, CA, which is now all merged into the Canadian CPA. But the big problem here is this. In the Canadian market, there are other major accounting bodies, so like the ACCA, CIMA, CIMA, as well as the US CPA and the US CMA. These acts, these accounting bodies are not really covered covered with this act. So the, the current the current procedures of PAM Act basically covers only certain accounting designation and again if you ask some people don't even know if they're some accounting designation don't even know if they're covered by this act next slide please obviously i mean the, the responsible accounting firm will certainly turn away if they are if there's a if you know if they suspect that somebody is, is attempting to, 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 to launder money but who's to say that <coughs> excuse me who's to say that that individual will not go to a smaller accounting firm, for example, who perhaps would be more than willing to assist with the transaction. So really, the vast majority of CPAs are professional ethical people, but there is a tiny proportion um, that will try, you know, to use ignorance of the law as an excuse to ensure the transaction goes through. Next slide, please. Right, so what are some of the recommendations? Well, again, I think for me, from my perspective, the most important findings here was that, <coughs> excuse me, was that accountants seems to be unaware of their compliance duties. And, and I can see where this comes into play. Um, if you go to the CPA program, there's no course that talks about <coughs> financial crimes or AML compliance, right? And this is related to the the final bullet there which, which focuses on education and reporting guidelines and so on another thing that i think that 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 could be of interest here to regulators is there needs to be more focus on enforcement and um 
you know, I do think that this probably will have some impact, especially for the smaller firms. If you have to pay $500,000 for not reporting an STR, that could be potentially, uh, that could potentially have serious repercussion on your firm. Next slide, please. Right, so some of the issues for the accounting professions to consider moving forward is that, you know, AML or generally financial crime issues should be a part of practice review. So are you really conducting your audit, audit correctly when it comes to AML compliance? Another key issue that I think has some potential here is to, is you need to create programs within these CPA forms that will train individuals to actually identify suspicious transactions. So. Um, based again from, from the interviews that we have collated, the biggest problems that I foresee moving forward for the accounting profession is actually two is uh, awareness, education, and enforcement of the, the AML guidelines. But one more minute, Mark. Uh, that's it, Jim. I think okay. I'm in, uh, well within eight minutes there. Okay, Thank perfect. You. Perfect yeah. timing. Thank you yeah. so much. No problem. Okay. That's fantastic. Uh, thank you again, Mark. And yeah. um, it's really enlightening to better understand uh, some of the shortcomings mm -hmm. of our regulations and uh, and those governing the practice of professionals like accountants who are obviously very critical in a number of transactions related to real estate. So uh, that's a great way to kick us off. So we're going to move now to Sam Cooper, uh, who joins us. And Sam's recent book, Willful Blindness, um, gives a incredibly comprehensive and detailed account of a number of mon money laundering issues, uh, primarily in British Columbia. And uh, and also, uh, I've really enjoyed reading the uh, the real estate parts of it, uh, but still confess to really struggling with the complexity of many of these transactions, which I think is obviously one of the challenges that we have in just kind of getting this into the, the public awareness and perhaps even some of the political, um, uh, getting kind of political leverage. So, um, uh, again, if you want to buy it, uh, it's easily available. And uh, right now, I'm going to ask Sam to take the floor and uh, give us a little overview of uh, money laundering and real estate and his view in this area. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jim, and, and thanks everyone for having me. It's a real honor. Uh, I'm speaking from Ottawa today, and as as some know, I got my uh, my 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 feet wet in reporting in Vancouver, and much of my findings relate to. Uh, Vancouver, but I'm in Ontario now and finding these uh, transactions, I'm going to share my screen, that we are speaking about uh, very much relate to Toronto and Montreal. So I revealed something uh, called the Vancouver model and Jim, you're right, it does get complex, but at a simple level, what I found was international organized crime. Most of my research uh, focused on China and Hong Kong, but also very much Middle Eastern organized crime, and I believe uh, Russian organized crime are using uh, gangs around the world, especially where diaspora communities uh, exist, uh, in ways to uh, facilitate the movement of corruption funds out of those countries, which you may uh, recognize as I do the commonality, uh, have authoritarian governments and therefore great deals of corruption. So we see oligarchs and tycoons moving funds out of countries such as China and Iran and using underground banking networks, which are really gang networks in, in cities around the world to move those funds. So let's, let's just focus on the Vancouver model. As I say, it's really the Macau model of money laundering. That is, uh, Chinese citizens uh, have a capital barrier of 50,000 US dollars is their limit. They can export per year. And so they found a neat way of getting money out, and that is through casinos in Macau, where you would uh, arrange a trip to the casino there, take out a, a loan, which may come directly in the form of casino chips or some cash from a gangster at a, a dinner inside the casino or perhaps at a, a venue, even a parking lot outside the casino. You can launder your funds out of China that way. And the trick here is that I'm going to go to a, a FinTrack slide that handily came out after, well, uh, during the writing of my book, which was which was lucky. They explain it very concisely. Uh, Bottom line, what is going on? Real estate is not the only problem. Demand. We, we can't see it. If you're trying to show it, we can't see it right now. 
Sam? Oh, let me. Jim, thanks for letting me know. Oh, yeah, no problem. No problem. Is it up now? Yes, we can see it. Oh, perfect. Thank you. So real estate is not the only problem. Demand exists on both sides. Organized crime has a lot of cash. Need to move it out of Canada. Chinese citizens have access to cash. Limit of 50K, restricts ability to spend, leads to development of services. So those services could be uh, the, the gangs, uh, in this case, operating in Vancouver, have uh, imported fentanyl precursors, uh, turned them into marketable drugs, very toxic and dangerous drugs, collected the cash, and they have literally warehouses of cash stashed in Vancouver, and they uh, they the service that was developed was on the other side. It could be tycoons, it could be oligarchs, just people that have gotten rich through uh, China's uh, growing wealth influence and, and system of economy want to move a, a large amount of funds out of that country. So they arranged to uh, meet a gangster uh, in a parking lot outside the casino and they were getting loans of, you know, from $100,000 in cash, 500,000 up to a million. You could walk into the casino, gamble it. If you were lucky that night, you got a check cut by the casino that can very easily turn into a, the down payment on a Vancouver condo. If you are unlucky, and uh, for many of these gamblers, uh, they have no limit of funds. So if you were unlucky, what you did was pay it back in Hong Kong or China where your banking or source of wealth is. So what you're looking at here is a, an RCMP investigation report, which says essentially uh, what I just explained. What I want to get across here is that uh, the Vancouver model was purpose built in British Columbia casinos. This wasn't an accident. Casinos uh, from the 90s started competing for the patronage, the wealth of these ultra wealthy people from China that were trying to get their wealth out. They built for them uh, private high limit baccarat rooms. Police were not in welcome or indeed uh, in many cases allowed inside. Casino investigators were barred from uh, scrutinizing transactions. And again, the bottom line here is that the Vancouver model was purpose built into BC's economy to benefit both, of course, the casino owners, the government, the gangsters benefited, and by the way, uh, there's indications that there were ownership interests from 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 gain associates, and of course, the people again on the other side trying to get wealth out of China benefited. So, how does this relate to real estate? Uh, what I have found, and my methods are uh, certainly I have some quantitative data, but uh, my reporting and research method has always been to follow the big fish, as it were, and that way you get a picture of what's going on. So what I really like to stress to people is I'm going to don't get whiplash as I, I scroll through my my PDF here and sometimes a picture really helps. So I focused again on what I learned about the whales in these BC casinos. Uh, as I've said, uh, you know, as a good starting point, if you have, you know, let's say 20 million to get out of China in gambling in a few years, of course, you're going to get a few good casino checks and be able to get down payments on homes. Uh, once you start paying for those homes through mortgages, uh, those those monthly payments can come from the very same loan shark and cash networks. And you can start to use the homes that you buy as collateral, of course, to leverage up and start developing bigger properties. And that would be exactly what uh, the person who became a poster boy in the Cullen Commission did. So who is this? Jiagui Gao. In 2015 at the River Rock Casino, BC government casino, he was the very top uh, whale. That is the very biggest revenue generator for BC Lottery Corporation government casinos. He gambled six million in six months uh, before uh, police heat started or scrutiny uh, started to be recognized in the community. And, and then I believe he he went away for a bit. But why is this man important? Uh, his his uh, occupation as listed uh, on this high risk ban sheet was a president of Real Estate Development Corporation in Vancouver. 
even before the Cullen Commission came to light, I, I did some digging and found out he was involved in very big real estate lending uh, and borrowing activity. Many mansions in Vancouver digging into files showed he was taking loans from known fentanyl traffickers. And what do you know? Uh, this is one one slide I would really want you to take away today that that blew my mind again as more evidence came out of the Cullen Commission. While he was the biggest revenue generator in, in BC government casinos, this record shows BC Lottery Corporation intelligence knew. I want to stress that it was known CBSA was investigating him as a precursor drug importer, a loan shark. We know, uh, you know, from my sourcing, this would be people in the RCMP, a very high level member of a transnational gang. Uh, and so what I want to stress is from just from uh, the gambling activity, the loan sharking activity, one can get their fingers into a housing market. But once you've been in this business for 10, 20, 30 years, as I explain in my book, you no longer probably look like a, a Mr. Gao who, you know, he doesn't look like a tycoon, but in if he's successful, maybe in 30, 40, 50 years, he would be the type of person that I identify a Hong Kong tycoon with very high level organized crime connections and connections to a foreign government that uh, in my research bought large tracts of land in Vancouver in the 1980s and 90s. So what I'm trying to convey here is the Vancouver model is a cycle of, of funds moving around the world. You can start at the lower end and, and start with a few homes in money laundering and decades later you can be buying large portions of another country and developing condo towers. So money laundering, um, it's complex, but it really oh, is about, about one, one, more, minute. one more minute. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks, Sam. Sure. I'll close out by saying that uh, in, in my narrative in the book, I wrote about this gentleman named Lee Lin Shaw. Again, uh, now that I have the quantitative data, I can find that he was responsible for $60 million in, in uh, suspicious transactions in, I believe, five years, 2010 to 2015, in BC government casinos. Not a very nice guy. Uh, again, uh, the, it, this RCMP report says a high limit back rat private salon was built for him in mind. And therefore, it may not surprise you that when he was found uh, found to be involved in sexual assaults of casino workers, uh, the casino wasn't too concerned about it. It appears that they covered it up. So I'll close by saying that my concern is this is very much occurring not only in Vancouver. I have now, uh, I'm, I'm about to break stories about some oligarch level uh, similar activity in, in, in Eastern cities. So uh, I'll, I'll end right there. Terrific. Thank you very much, Sam. That was uh, that actually uh, cleared up a couple of things by way of the complexity of those transactions. So that was really helpful uh, for me, at least. And uh, and I think also gives us a sense of the gravity of the issue. Um, and speaking of gravity of, of the issue, uh, we're now going to turn to uh, Professor Maureen Maloney from Simon Fraser University. And uh, importantly, uh, Maureen chaired the expert panel on money laundering uh, for the Ministry of Finance in British Columbia that reported in 2019. And one of the very one of the specific questions they addressed is the role of money laundering in real estate. And uh, we're very delighted to have her here to uh, help shed light on this issue for us. Thanks so much for being here, Maureen. Thank you. My great pleasure to be here and thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, first of all, I have the great privilege to uh, live and work on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, particularly the the uh, Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam people. So I, I thank them for that. Um, after Sam's great presentation, who has been uh, absolutely instrumental in making governments, certainly in BC, but I think in Canada generally, take money laundering much more seriously than it has been uh, in the past. But I did want to just back up for a few minutes. I I'm sure everybody knows this, but I just wanted to say why money laundering is so important that we actually address it and why, why we haven't done too, particularly in the real estate market, which is uh, my area of interest. The easier it is to money launder, the more criminals you're actually inviting into your country. It's just a given. If it's easy to do it, then people will come. And Canada happens to be a very easy place to money launder. 
It also means that the drug problem accelerates and certainly in BC and Ontario, we've had just horrendous uh, amounts of people dying from fentanyl and other uh, illegal drugs. The more crime you have, the more organized crime you, you have in your in your country. And certainly Sam's uh, great uh, research and investigative reporting has shown that remarkably. It also distorts the economy because it's very hard for legitimate businesses to deal with tax evading criminals. So it's, it's not an, 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 a level playing field. And certainly that's true when we come to the real estate market. It also undermines the rule of law. Trusted professions, as we found out from Mark at the beginning, like accountants and, uh, uh, and lawyers and institutions uh, have their integrity eroded as they start being complicit in some of these uh, institutions. Housing affordability, which is one of the issues that, that I will deal with, increases. And certainly we found out that it did do with respect to um, uh, BC. And certainly I think uh, the advent of money laundering and certainly the Vancouver model has really damaged uh, Vancouver and particularly Canada, I think, reputation in the international market, which, of course, is very important if we want to invest. Now, why is real estate in particular? I mean, Sam's done a very good job about casinos, but why is real estate in particular one of the great ways to money launder? Well, there are a number of reasons. One, it's a large and diffuse market with very high value assets, certainly if you live in Vancouver uh, or Toronto, um, and increasingly in other areas of Canada. It's easy to enter. You don't need any expertise to buy a house. Real estate, at least in Canada, is a secure investment and people who are in the drug trade, etc., like to have secure investments. There's a certainty of legal ownership, but many ways to hide who actually owns the property. And I'll talk about that in, in a few moments. You can also generate uh, profit from speculation, from rents and from renovations. So there are a number of ways to extract money and, and to clean money through real estate. It also can be a prestigious investment. And also you may actually need it to pursue the criminal activities you're talking about. So real estate is a prime area, certainly where you've got really high retail, retail values. You can get rid of like seven million <laughs> just by buying an ordinary priced house in Vancouver at the moment, which is absolutely uh, absurd. So along with my uh, two panellists, and particularly with uh, Brigitte Unger, who works at the University of Utrecht and is probably one of the the uh, the biggest uh, uh, academics in all of Europe looking at money laundering in real estate in Europe. And she's developed a, a gravity model by which we applied to Canada first and then to BC to determine uh, how much money laundering is actually taking place. Now, I am very clear and certainly in our report, there are a lot of caveats to these <laughs> numbers. Uh, as three academics, we would have loved to actually sort of send out questionnaires to organized crime people and said, you know, how do you spend your money and where do you spend it? We just thought that the take up might be very low. So in fact, we couldn't do that. So we use this gravity model, which is usually usually for international transfers, but has been used quite a, 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 a quite a great deal within Europe. So for Canada, we estimated in 2018 that 47 billion dollars was washed through Canadian. This is all uh, all, all investments now, but 47 billion. For BC, we estimated that was 7.4 billion. And then th these figures get uh, less and less secure as we go down, by the way, because we're using more and more caveats with respect to it. So I want to be very clear about that. But then we try to estimate how much of that 7.4 billion went through real estate. And we estimate, and we think it's a reasonably good estimate, that it was 5.3 billion that was washed through uh, real estate prices, which again, we looked at the estimate, how much would that increase the price of a house? And we said 5%, but again, it would depend where the money, we're talking through all of BC, but if all that money were invested in Vancouver, it could make a difference of 10 or 15%, depending upon the area that it was invested in. And we just don't have the, 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 the data to actually make that assumption. So how do we look, uh, what, what, what are we looking for? And certainly Transparency International has done some very good work in Vancouver and Toronto with respect to looking at some of the, the red flag analysis that the Financial Action Task Force, uh, an international body, has looked for what are red flags for, for money laundering in uh, real estate. Will you look for unusual ownership patterns? For example, uh, uh, Transparency International, looking at the top, uh, the, the, the most expensive 100 houses in Vancouver and the most expensive houses in Toronto, and I'm 
this may be slightly off, but I think 50% of those are owned by companies or trust funds, so we don't know actually who owns them. So again, being able to just cover up the ownership is extremely important. You look for unusual payment patterns. Is somebody paying way more money than they normally would have done or way less money for something? And how many times has it been circulated in the market? If something is flipped constantly, that might raise a red flag that this is in fact trying to uh, use for money laundering. Especially in a hot market, it's very, very difficult to look at these, these uh, indicators because those indicators happen quite reasonably and are all legal. <laughs> so even if you have like 10 of the red flags in it, it doesn't mean that that is definitely money laundered. It means that you're in a very hot housing market and all those things may be legal. But the more red flags you have, it might be that more investigation needs to be done with respect to it. So what are we looking for? We're looking for uh, people who have no mortgage or unregulated lenders. The number of unregulated lenders, by the way, in BC has gone up astronomically in the last decade. So uh, again, we don't know who they are. They're not specified. The, the ownership is not there. So what were some of the recommendations that we made? I think probably the most important recommendation we made that fortunately the BC government has taken up is to put in a land ownership transparency, <clears throat> uh, land ownership transparency uh, account, which means that anybody who registered real estate in BC now has to state who owns at least 10% of that beneficial ownership. Now, again, the, the dates have been delayed a bit for everybody to put those in, but just being able to look at somebody who actually owns the property and start connecting the dots will make an enormous difference. And that, in fact, I think is probably one of the best land ownership transparency acts that there is uh, in the world at the moment. And I really congratulate the government for doing that. We also need to do a beneficial ownership for companies because the same way people are hiding who owns all these properties and we need to know. We need to regulate money services businesses. As I said before, a lot of the unregulated mortgage lenders, etc., we have no idea where that money's coming from or who owns that money. And we also have to ensure that anybody in the process of real estate uh, transactions, whether it be the realtor, whether it be the lawyer, whether it be the accountant, all of them should have uh, a money laundering uh, mandate that they have to put into place education, as Mark mentioned in the first presentation, and also that they have to uh, take it seriously. So we, we, the, uh, the other one that we said, and probably the most controversial one that we suggested, uh, and, and I'll finish on this because I, I look forward to questions and that, but we also suggested something that England has brought in. I'm not sure that it would actually pass muster in the Supreme Court of Canada, I, I should say that but uh, uh, would be to consider the introduction of an explained wealth order. And I'll give you an ex example of what this is. There's a, a test case going through the uh, UK courts at the moment, and I think the UK courts will uphold it because they have much stronger laws than, than we do. But in this case, there's a, a woman from uh, Ab Azerbaijan, I always mispronounce that, Azerbaijan, who uh, was the spouse of a, a known corrupt official in Azerbaijan. She bought a house, I forgot what the figures are now, but for 50 million. And so that she had no known assets. She had no known ways of getting that money. And so the unexplained wealth order allows the authorities to go up and say, look, we have no idea. She also did shopping sprees in Harrods for 10 million a day, et cetera. And she bought herself a private plane, but there was no uh, way to find out where she was getting this money from. And so uh, this allows, there are a number of, requirements for this to happen before they can turn up but they turn up and say we have no way whether your source has been coming from so you have to tell us where this money is coming from and so she said like going back to Sam oh I wanted in casinos I had a big inheritance but she couldn't prove any of that at all and so that case is now going through the courts as to whether or not they can confiscate certainly the property with respect to the money that she's bought unless she can come up with a, a reason as to why um uh, where, where the funding of that money comes from. And again, uh, it's quite draconian. Again, I think the Supreme Court of Canada would be less likely to put uh, to uphold that, I think, than the, the su Supreme Court in the UK will do. But I do think we do need to start taking this seriously and we need to have some serious measures and we need to have much better crime enforcement uh, with respect to this because it really has been incredibly lacking. And again, if it's easy to money launder, people will come. <laughs> if we build it, they will come and they will buy it. And certainly in very hot markets like uh, our own in Vancouver and uh, 
uh, and Toronto in particular, but uh, very happy to answer any questions that people have. Well, thank you very much for that, Maureen. It was really, really insightful and uh, uh, I, some really concise things for us to take away from it in terms of action. Um, certainly kudos to the British Columbia government for uh, at least beginning to take some action, but it sounds like there's still a fair bit left to do. So uh, we're going to move on to our final panelist uh, today, and that's Dr. Stephen Schneider from the Department of Criminology at St. Mary's University. And um, Stephen uh, is also um, has just finished a book, so I think it's going to be a little bit of time before we can get it. But uh, um, uh, kudos to you for that, and uh, thanks for being here today. We're very much looking forward to your remarks. Take it away, Stephen. Thank you very much. Uh, let me know if you can hear me OK and see my slides. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, I'm going to speak to you a bit. Uh, first of all, it's an honor to be speaking to you from Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Uh, what I'm going to do today is briefly give a, a chronology of my research into money laundering generally and, and money laundering in the real estate sector specifically. And, and just to build on what Maureen was saying, um, there's basically three goals of money laundering, what I call the three C's, convert, conceal, and create. So you want to convert uh, the proceeds of crime cash into a less suspicious asset. Uh, you want to conceal the criminal ownership and you want to create a legitimate uh, um, passage for that money. And real estate uh, in many ways can actually um, satisfy those goals. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen. So my first study that I did was, uh, and again, Jim, Claire, let me know if, uh, if you can see this okay. Um, the first study I did was way back in 1989 when I was a, a student at Carleton University in Ottawa and I was working for the federal government at the same time. It was the first study in a money laundering called the Tracing Illicit Funds Money Laundering Canada. It was uh, co-authored with Margaret Beer. Um, and money laundering was not even a crime when this study was undertaken. And there wasn't a lot of police cases or other data to work with. Um, but with that said, the study did identify already real estate as a major money laundering vehicle. And, and really there's a, a continuum or a spectrum from the very simple where you, you buy a house with the proceeds of crime to live in, which is the predominant way to uh, that the proceeds of crime enters the real estate market. And then there's more sophisticated complex cases. And certainly what Sam talked about uh, was one of the more complex case studies, which I'll talk about in a bit. But but one of the more complex cases that we discovered, and this goes way back to the 80s and involved uh, a lawyer named Gary Hendon, who was laundering money for one of the biggest drug trafficking organizations in the world, um, actually was a wing of the Rizzuto Mafia family in Montreal. And I'll just show you briefly um, uh, the, um, uh, the MO here. Uh, and you can see the sort of complexity that can be factored into to money laundering through real estate. Basically, the drugs would be sold in, sold in the international market, the cash given to Gary Hendon, who would deposit it into a Canadian bank account. The money was then wire transferred into a foreign bank account in a tax haven uh, island. The bank account was actually controlled by the criminal or members of the criminal organization. It was a shell company uh, to which the bank account uh, was registered. And what happened then was the money was brought back into Canada via a mortgage. So a mortgage would be issued uh, from this shell company. It would be used to purchase real estate. And of course, Gary Hannon would be the lawyer. The money would go in trust. And so now you've accomplished a lot of the goals of money laundering. You've converted cash into a less suspicious asset. You've been able to take advantage of tax shelters, international transactions, which are difficult for Canadian police to investigate. The money has a legitimate source, apparently, in a mortgage. It was invested in real estate. Uh, and they often would uh, use other intermediaries like a, a construction company, investment firms, even a currency exchange to uh, layer the money. Um, and often they would flip the real estate as well so that they would generate revenue from, from that as well. <clears throat> the next um, study that I did was uh, in 2004, and this was uh, a study that I did for the RCMP. It was one of the first quantitative studies of, of money laundering. And so I was at, given access to uh, over 150, actually over 200 RCMP cases, 150 of which made the study. Um, and if you, as I scroll through here, um, one of the first things to note is that um, real estate, this, so this looks at the percentage of um, cases that involved each of these economic sectors. So um, deposit institutions obviously are always the most predominant laundering mechanism out there. Insurance industry was the second. It was involved in 60, almost 65% of cases. 
Motor vehicles were purchased in almost 50 or 60 cases, 60% of cases. And the real estate was at uh, roughly 56% of all cases. But if you actually look at the amount of money invested, real estate was second only to deposit institutions. And the other thing to note is that insurance, the insurance industry was used not as an explicit mo uh, method to launder money, but because people were buying big ticket items like homes and cars, they had to insure it. So they would purchase insurance. The other thing to note is that when lawyers are involved in money laundering unwittingly, they tend to be involved in a real estate transaction. Um, and so uh, I'm going to scroll through here a little more. Um, and when you're looking at uh, the ways that uh, the money entered the real estate market, the proceeds of the crime, uh, the vast majority of it came in as a mortgage. So the proceeds of crime would be, mostly be used as a down payment, they get a mortgage and then the mortgage would be paid off with the proceeds of crime. Sometimes these would be fake mortgages like I showed before. Uh, oftentimes uh, the, the money entered the real estate market in cash. I mean, literally in cash where someone would bring a bag full of cash to a lawyer and the lawyer when, would then deposit into his trust account. And then 33% uh, of the cases, 34%, the purchase was made with a monetary instrument, bank draft, um, often from an offshore account. As far as, um, techniques used to launder money in real estate. Again, the more you can sort of obfuscate uh, the source of your funds, uh, the criminal ownership, the better you have at laundering it. Um, and registering property in a nominee's name is, again, Maureen brought this up, the whole idea of beneficial ownership, huge in money laundering, very common technique. So mortgages, homes, property would be listed in the name of a, a brother or a sister or someone with a clean uh, background. Fake mortgage, as I talked about, um, doing extensive renovations and construction of a home and then using the proceeds of crime to pay the, the contractor, usually uh, under the table. Um, purchasing revenue property, again, what would happen here is you purchase a property you would lease or rent out, and then you would commingle the proceeds of crime with that rental income and deposit it, or you would just simply declare proceeds of crime, drug cash as rental income. Um, and flipping properties as well, buying a property, flipping it, getting a cashier's check or whatever, they, you've just laundered your money. And finally, as far as, um, uh, as um, lawyers are concerned, as I mentioned, uh, they're used uh, oft frequently in money laundering, but what our research shows, and the same with accountants, as, as was mentioned before, the majority of them were used uh, unwittingly, but a lot of these transactions were very suspicious. I mean, literally giving bags of cash to lawyers, uh, which were then deposited in trust accounts. Um, the uh, the next study I, I did, I, I published an article in the Journal of Property Research, and this basically summarizes um, the research I did for the RCMP study. But um, the context of this is that there are various reasons why organized crime becomes involved in the real estate uh, industry and, and money laundering is simply one of those reasons that I don't have time to get into all the reasons, but certainly in the last 40, 50 years, um, the rise of marijuana grow ups has had a huge impact on real estate. Um, so we, unlike you know, Mexico or Jamaica or California or Vietnam, where, where the marijuana is grown outdoors, Canada innovated in doing most of their uh, grow ups indoors. So they would buy homes, big homes in, in the suburbs. Um, and when those grow ups grew too big, they moved to industrial land. Um, there was one case that on, I think was in Oakville where they actually purchased an old Molson brewery. And uh, when police raided it, they discovered over 30,000 plants. They used warehouses. And we didn't, when they couldn't contain uh, in those locations, they went to rural areas. And I think the biggest grow up was discovered somewhere in Ontario, and there was over 40,000 marijuana plants in this uh, rural land. So, so again, you can see there's various reasons why organized crime does get involved in um, in the real estate sector. Um, one of which, again, is mortgage fraud, uh, and they'll get into mortgage fraud not to launder money, but as a revenue generator in it itself. Um, in 2007, Margaret Beer and I published a, a book called Money Laundering in Canada, Chasing Dirty and Dangerous Dollars, and it, it, it looked not only at organized crime, but also terrorist financing. And what we found through our research is that real estate was being purchased not to launder money by extremist groups, um, but to generate revenue, which would be sent back to the home country um, as part of their financing. And so you saw a lot of mortgage fraud as a generator, but also purchasing and flipping real estate by certain um, uh, uh, terrorist groups. 
Uh, the last few years, I spent a lot of research uh, looking at professional money launderers, and uh, these are people that that specialize in laundering money. And that brings me to uh, the last bit of research I've done. Um, so other presenters have mentioned the Cullen Commission, which is a government commission looking at money laundering in BC, which was really spurred by one massive uh, money laundering operation um, by a few individuals at the center. Um, and what was uh, probably most interesting about this, in addition to laundering money through casinos, as um, Sam talked about, the other major uh, Avenue was real estate. And so um, I'll show you this little graphic I nipped from the Globe and Mail. Um, basically, the professional money launders would literally take bags of cash. So they were based out of Richmond in BC. Um, the bad guys, local drug dealers, even Mexican cartels would bring bags full of cash to the parking lot of this Richmond firm. Uh, and then the money was lent out again, literally in cash. Sam talked about how bags of cash were brought to casinos. In this case, the cash was literally lent to home buyers and often to realtors inter intermediaries. Um, and so uh, the mortgages were uh, the main way that the drug proceeds were laundered as opposed to the bad guys purchasing property themselves. And this was really a forte of the main money launderer because he was really a loan shark. So he knew a lot about lending money out and he would use sort of traditional loan sharking techniques, including violence. So um, the money be lent out to a home purchaser, then the purchaser would, would wire uh, transfer funds into the uh, private lender's account. So you, it, back in China, so you'd launder the money that way. Um, and again, the loan shark or the loan shark slash professional money launderer um, was not only laundering money, he was making money off the mortgages through interest, through liens, um, and uh, also you know collecting debts uh, and interest, which he can claim as uh, legitimate revenue. So. Um, so I think that pretty much brings us up to date. And uh, but again, when you're looking at money laundering in Canada, you're looking at the simple to sophisticated uh, from simply purchasing a house all the way up to very complex schemes that involve mortgages and fake companies and offshore tax uh, offshore accounts, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Well, that's terrific. Terrific. Thank you Thank so you much, so Stephen. And uh, uh, if you can just you can mute, that would be. Perfect. Thanks. I think we're getting some echo back from your uh, from your very uh, nicely wooded room. Um, at any rate, so uh, thanks to everyone from our presenters. Uh, this was really fascinating. And uh, so really what I want to do is I want to, uh, I've seen a lot of activity in the chat. I haven't been able to read it carefully. And uh, I, although I know that uh, uh, Claire has been monitoring a little bit and Cynthia. And so maybe we'll throw it out for a first question. Um, Claire, Cynthia, can you... Um, yeah. Point us to the right person. Sure, definitely. I was wondering, do you want to start with, um, do you want to start with Mark or um, how do you want to go exactly? Uh, I think we can uh, just, you know, first question up in, yeah, in that you sure, see sure, in the sure, chat. Sure. Let's let's go first come first serve and uh, yeah. we'll, we'll see um, where it takes us. So I think Naomi Steinberg throughout the conversation had a few different questions. I'll give you the floor, Naomi, if you would like to say something or I can read your um, question. All right, read the question then. So um, Naomi asks if the proceeds of um, crime money laundering has a narrow definition of uh, accountant, how about their definition of terrorist? As we clean up and tighten up, what measures do we also need to put in place to ensure ongoing civility and celebration of cultural diversity? The question to you, Mark. Well, for me? Um, yeah, well, <laughs> you know, and I think this this came through from, from most of the presentation. The, the biggest problem that I find uh, doing uh, investigating and, and researching financial crimes in Canada is that most of these institutions are self-regulatory organizations, SROs. So if you look at the securities industry, for example, enforcement is weak. If you look at corporate accounting fraud, I mean, we had I met back in the days, enforcement is weak. And same thing here, like this, this evidence that has been presented here is no secret. It's all out there. So the question for me is why? Why are we not acting upon this evidence? Right. This is the same thing that I've said to the Securities Commission, the, set, the Prevention Securities Commission. The evidence in, is there regarding Ponzi schemes in Canada. Why are you not acting upon it? And that's the same question I'll throw back again uh, to regulators. 
well, that would be a great one for uh, to hear from all the panel. Why isn't it being better addressed? I'll Cynical. Actually, I'm, yeah, I'm, go ahead. Yeah, I'm go, go, have a, a go ahead, Maureen, and then Sam. Yeah, please. Uh, I think one of the reasons is that uh, our laws aren't that good. For example, in England, which has taken money laundering much more seriously, and I'm a former English lawyer too, so I get a lot of the stuff from the law society there, and they they take it very seriously. Um, for example, um, they have amended their legislation, which the federal government I is doing here, though, to, to anybody who even unwittingly assists a money launderer, if there was any evidence. So, for example, if somebody turned up with a bag of money and you say, well, I didn't know they were a money launderer, in the US, uh, in the UK, they say, we don't we don't care. Like if somebody turns up with a, a bag of money, you've got big red flags going off there. So they, they can actually uh, criminally charge somebody. And it is very difficult to uh, because you to be shown to be a money launderer, you have to have a predicate crime. So you have to have a predicate crime. And th there has to be a, a line of evidence that goes forward that that's the money that you are money laundering. It can't be just from somewhere else or some vague thing that you're doing. It has to be from that crime. And certainly you can possibly do that. It's still difficult and certainly to speak to prosecutors uh, uh, and the police will say it's really complicated and it's really difficult. We have to keep the predicate crime there. We're better off just trying to get them on the actual crime rather than trying to then try and do flow of money laundering. And in particular, if it's money laundering from crimes that have happened offshore, it's nearly impossible to get that information. So the only money launderers you can kind of go after in in, uh, in Canada at the moment really are domestic money launderers rather than people who are committing crimes offshore or, or bring corrupt funds in, et cetera. So that's a, a rather long answer, but uh, we need to do better laws, I think, and better enforcement. Absolutely. So Sam, anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I would build on what Maureen said. Uh, uh, a lot of my research would come from uh, lawyers, uh, prosecutors, uh, former RCMP anti-gang unit people. And I think there's a wide, pretty much, you know, a recognition that uh, Canada has been very weak with with tackling real organized crime. Uh, in my book, I, 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 I had a line that something like the the United States Anti-Racketeering Organization Act, which was seen as very effective in tackling when the the mafias in New York had such a grip on that city, the FBI got really tough through a very innovative law that could target the whole organization. So I argued we need something similar in Canada. And then it turned out again through the Cullen Commission, I found that uh, BC's Attorney General wrote a letter to our public safety minister saying that uh, he had information from uh, Maureen's colleague Peter German that our laws are completely ineffectual in tackling real organized crime. I also think, you know, some people have the anecdotally, Canada just hasn't been very serious in tackling big upstream issues. Uh, we're, there was a speech in Parliament the other day that we haven't been that you know good at upholding the rule of law. So we get into a position where you know people just act the way they want to act and uh, some bad things happen and then it puts you in a corner where you may have to <laughs> enact some very tough laws that roll back. Uh, liberties that we all would like to have. So that's what I, a, a few quick sh thoughts in a nutshell. Great. Stephen, did you want to add to, to this particular? Line of well, discussion? just to say that um, one of the books you mentioned, uh, thank you, Claire, for <laughs> blatantly putting that uh, plug up there, but it looks at the history of organized crime. And, and the one thing we learn about the history of organized crime, organized crime in Canada is Canada has always been in denial that we actually have a crime problem. Um, and even in Ottawa now, we see the, you know, we've always denied that we have a far right extremist problem until it kicks us in the face. We're, we're kind of, you know, in this sort of sense of a benign uh, ignorance about crime. And even in, as late as the early 60s, you know, uh, Attorney General of Ontario denied we had the mafia in this country, even though they exist here for 30 years. But I'll also say this. Um, we can bring in all the toughest laws we want. We can bring in RICO and, and we can go to a, you know, a police state like China. We're never going to get rid of this problem. I mean, China, Russia, United States have some of the toughest laws in the world on money laundering and organized crime, yet they have the exact same problems we have. So we're, we tend to be, you know, kind of flitting around the edges here. Um, but the same, as long as we're going to have a free market system uh, where our, you know, 
our financial banks are, uh, are laundering money and committing extensive amount of crimes um, themselves, then you know we're never truly going to be able to clamp down on, on this uh, problem. Jim, I just want to add something before yeah. we go. Yeah, I agree. We are not going to we are not going to stop this, but we can mitigate the downstream effects on Canadians if we start proper enforcement. Okay, terrific. Thanks for that. So uh, <clears throat> maybe we'll go back to the pool for another question. Um, and I want to apologize in advance because there's no way we're going to be able to get to to all of the things that uh, that people are wanting to discuss, which is you know uh, filling probably several hundred words now of, uh, of text in the chat. So thank you for the, your contributions, but and accept my apologies in advance. But Claire, uh, have you got another one that you'd like to, to tee up? Oh, you're on mute. The most uttered word in on earth <laughs> yeah. for the last two years. <laughs> we actually have two people who have their hands up at the moment. So oh, okay. maybe we want to go to them. The first one is, I think, David, um, would you like to speak? If not, we also have um, Olivier. I'd like to speak. Who has his hand up or no? We also have JP, who actually had the next question uh, written down. You'd like to turn your mic on. Oh, yes. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you, Claire. Um, and thank you to the panel. Um, my question was, um, unaffordable housing caused by dirty money or in part by dirty money is a problem all over the world. And I'm just wondering if there are any examples of countries that have acted effectively against it and, you know, adequately tackled this issue and, you know, alleviated the problem in some way that we can look to as a model. Great question. Any, anybody like to tackle that from the panel? I'll speak to it briefly. I, I, um, I'm a little skeptical, quite frankly, of, uh, with all due respect to Marina, uh, uh, her, her report, who had caveats on, on her estimates as well. I'm, I'm skeptical of the impact that dirty money has on the overall housing market, uh, perhaps some, some extent in Vancouver, um, but globally, I don't think it, it, it's a, uh, it's a minuscule amount, relatively speaking. Um, if you're going to tackle affordable housing, uh, certainly in Canada, you need governments to be more involved in actually building housing. So we've relied far too much, you know, on uh, private sector. Um, you know, CMHC got out of housing back in the 90s, I guess, when Paul Martin was the minister, correct me if I'm wrong. And we've had a problem with homelessness ever since then. So I'm starting to, you know, so it, it to me, it's not dirty money. Uh, that is limiting affordable housing or having an impact on affordable housing. It's the fact that government is no longer in the business of building social housing, affordable housing, and we've left to the private sector. Right. So an issue, but but not uh, by any means the dominant one, um, except potentially in some uh, fairly influential in some markets. Is that fair to say? Yeah, Sam, go ahead. Yeah, I would. I would. Agree mostly, but I would say in some markets like Vancouver, you know, some of my re research shows that this the the sort of um, facilitation of global money has really captured portions of the market so that homes are just there's no room in the free market system to build affordable homes for for people that live and work, uh, let, let alone people that live and work in that city working at you know, lower tier jobs. So families are being forced to to exit the city. And uh, it really is, I do believe, uh, again, uh, the, the attorney general there, David Eby, pointed to a very well-known New York uh, investment manager that said, if you want to be rich these days, you should either buy X investment or a condo in Vancouver. And so it's become a global market where another great researcher, Andy Yan in Vancouver, says we need to build homes for people that purpose build them for, for what they're, they're meant to live in and to support a family. They're not meant as investment vehicles. Yeah, no, that's that's totally fair. So that, that's, I think, uh, charts some common ground there. Uh, did you want to add anything, Maureen? Um, not really. I, I agree with both uh, Sam and, and Steve. Now, I don't think that, uh, that money laundering by itself has created like these highly inflated uh, hot markets. I do think it contributes to it. 
I, I think probably the country that's done the best so far, uh, I think, is England. But again, they have a massive homeless problem as well. So it's not that they have solved it. I just think that they have taken it more seriously earlier than we have done. But uh, I think it requires not just trying to address money laundering, but it does need to address building affordable houses for the teachers and for the firefighters and all the people who actually make our city livable uh, and uh, the services that we all need. But uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a much bigger problem than money laundering, although money laundering is a really big problem. Right. Yeah, no, and that's that's fair. And certainly the UK, I think the privatisation that, uh, that Stephen describes is something that's been present in the UK since uh, 1980 and Margaret Thatcher's election and the council sell-off. Um, Canada never actually had that great of a, of a penetration of the public sector into the housing system. So, you know, the best estimates are four to six percent of Canadians receive their housing um, from uh, the public sector, whereas in the UK prior to Margaret Thatcher, it was 33% and after Thatcher, it was, and now it's still 22%. So that's a huge proportion. It's very, very different. And so the, the very large market penetration, like the private market penetration we have in our housing system, and we depend on the private market for affordable housing, sounds like it's a big factor in this and may actually mean that the effect of things like money laundering and other sorts of things is, is more prevalent here. So, uh, but this is not for me to talk. I would like to move on to a, a next question uh, and then I'll probably jump into some too. Yeah, um, so our next question is from Daniela. Um, would you like to speak or should I read? Um, so she is asking, considering that the government is complicit in this and interested in sustaining the model, um, what is one way we can hold government accountable? So this is this was written during Sam when Sam was speaking, but it can be thrown out to everyone, I think. Sure, uh, I'll jump in first. And I think the way to hold government accountable is uh, panels like this, uh, yeah. research reports, and just getting experts together uh, so that more people are hearing about really how uh, messy and rotten it can be in certain markets. That again, I, I, do, I would stress that I do believe certain markets have been totally captured, not just by organized crime facilitators, but facilitators that help to move the wealth of the world into a city at the uh, you know uh, against the interests of people that are living and working there. So more talk, more articles, more research. Just want to add to that as well. I think I think government needs to get involved much more at a grassroots level. So for example, regulating the professions, all the professions, the gatekeepers. Um, if you look at if you look at what's happening right now, and this again is came across from panel present panel presentation is that there are different networks operating within the financial sector, network of accountants, network of lawyers, a tiny proportion, of course, are operating in various programs, various districts to facilitate this. So if you get stronger laws at a grassroots level to weed that out, we could have, as I said, we not stop it, but we'll mitigate the downstream effects on Canadians. Yeah, just to add to what uh, uh, Sam and Mark said, though, too, I think it's worth bearing in mind just how much the real estate market is worth to governments. I mean, the, the real estate market in BC accounts for over 10% of the BC economy, which is just an enormous amount. In 2020, there were 100,000 transactions that amounted to $70 billion. And of that, because of the property purchase tax that the government's put in, they rake in between $1.5 and $3 billion. So they're, they're, they are quite implicit on that. It would be good to sort of have that money being used for more and more affordable housing, it seems to me, too, that there should be some quid pro quo for that. So let me ask a, a couple of questions about, you know, one thing that's already been implemented in some places and uh, one measure that's, uh, you know, increasingly been contemplated. Uh, and the one that's been implemented in a few places is the empty homes tax. Is this something that that might actually make a difference? Or, uh, I mean, I've also heard critiques that say, like, you know, this is a, a, a kind of small penalty, uh, a, the, the, a small kind of bump in the price of doing business for uh, so pe for people who are working in these networks and laundering money. Any thoughts on empty homes tax? And then I'll, well, I'll throw it out there too. The other one uh, that people have increasingly been talking about is monitoring capital gains, uh, which is obviously a very sensitive topic um, uh, more closely, and, and that has potential negative consequences for its enforcement too. Uh, on the empty homes, I mean, uh, I think it's a great step and 
again, uh, not to hammer the same uh, nail, but there are portions in Vancouver where you don't see homes lived in. And yet I think it's very open to my impression from some of the people that the realtors that will give me information is it's very pretty easy to game the system and and claim a home is lived in. You would really need the 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 auditing resources to to go in and investigate whether the claims are mm -hmm. accurate uh, to to really hold that system up. And I think that gets again to what Maureen was saying. You know, you have to take a problem very seriously. You have to think. You know, does our Charter of Rights stops? things like wealth uh, explanation orders from being done in Canada or very rigorous examination of whether people are claiming, you know, accurately the, the, the home status lived in or not. Yeah, and just to add to that too, I haven't done specific research myself on this, but I, I've read a, some of the work that has been done. And for example, when we were looking at who owned real estate property to the, in, in uh, BC, we found that very high-end homes, like worth 10 million and over, were their occupation was student. Mm. <laughs> so probably they couldn't probably afford that house. But I mean, there are lots of easy ways of getting uh, uh, around, you know, uh, unoccupied homes. It seems to me so, uh, and yeah. I don't know how much investigation is actually done with respect to it. So. Yeah, that's fair. Okay, maybe we'll go back to. Uh... The audience. Um, Francis's hand is up. Would you like to say something? Sure, thank you. So in listening, this is all very, uh, very useful and very, uh, I mean, very illuminating, I would say. The question I have is this. We tend to collect data and information for very limited and restrictive purposes in Canada. So um, you get your information to one agency. It's for this specific use, whereas it seems a lot of the cases that you're putting together here will require some sort of combination of data from various sources. Is the fact that we tend to collect data for limited uh, restrictive uh, purpose also one of the, uh, the, the drivers for this situation? Because it would seem based on the way we collect data that most of it will only be caught after the fact, not before the fact. Jim, I can take that. Yeah, please. Yeah, please go ahead, Mark. Um, so I, I don't really think that's so much of a problem really in Canada. I mean, it, it doesn't matter which sector you are. So for example, again, if you look at the security sector, the data you collect from that sector, you obviously would present it to the Ontario Securities Commission, the BC Commission, Provincial Commission. So they, they have the findings there. The problem that I find is to mobilize the findings having people there to mobilize the findings from all the findings that have been presented here today, other findings um, it, it, that has been presented in other parts in Canada and so on. I don't think, I don't think there's any sort of um, mobilization of the resources and findings to get, get this out, education, awareness, right? Um, I think that's that's severely lacking in, in the Canadian context. It's not so much a data problem. Like I, I don't really have problems collecting data, for example, to build any machine learning models that I want to build. It's just that the research is out there. Try to mobilize it. Get, getting it mobilized is a problem. Any other thoughts on that particular issue? I've, I'll, I'll build on it if... Uh... Yeah, maybe I'll say that uh, I disagree somewhat with you, Mark, in that we, we found that that when uh, data is collected for one purpose, now partly this is freedom of information laws too, you can't use it for a different purpose. And we found that a, a lot of the, the, the data banks don't actually, uh, are not uh, compatible with each other. So there were lots of data points that different people along the continuum told us like, it would be really helpful if I'd known that and then this, but I only knew this little piece of it and I couldn't put it together. And so uh, we thought that there, there should be much more data sharing and that we should have much more compatible data too, certainly with respect to uh, uh, police investigations. But again, they need a, a warrant for that too. But but we have very, uh, certainly, I, I'm now talking about BC, so it may be true, not true in other provinces, but we had a lot of incompatible data points that really do make it much more difficult to sort of try a, a, and unpack this stuff. Yeah, so I think that sounds like data for different purposes, one for building machine learning models and another for investigations. And uh, certainly I know uh, myself uh, have been, uh, well, I suppose surprised in some ways, but also frustrated by the lack of data 
uh, that exists on what is a pretty fundamental transaction in people's lives, right? The transaction between uh, that's related to their home, whether it be a purchase of a home or whether it be with a landlord. And we actually have very little of that. And I know that when um, it was only a couple of years ago that uh, CRA uh, clarified the way that you can report capital gains, for example, um, and that previously was actually very difficult to report them, even though they they are supposed to be taxed on second on non principal residences. Um, so, what about data? Are there? I mean, we've had a couple of thoughts here about uh, data sources that might need to exist that don't already. One of the things I'm working on is trying to get landlords to report. Um, Right now, landlords, if they operate a business, they just report their revenues and expenses and deductions and so forth uh, through their taxes. I'd also like to see them reporting. I have this many units. Uh, here's some basic features of the units and here are the tenants and the rents that they pay so that we can track things related to the housing crisis. And I'd like the tenants to do something that's a corollary to that so that we can better track the nature of, uh, of the problems that we face in the housing sector. Is there something analogous that needs to happen uh, to deal with some of the issues related to, to money laundering in terms of uh, housing and data? Sam, you look like you're... I, I defer a little bit to uh, people like Maureen and Stephen on, on data, but I mean, I, I know that in my research, I have found that uh, People that were, I, I cited a, an RCMP study that was leaked to me that, that pointed to the very high end of Vancouver real estate and people within RCMP intelligence databases known and connected to drug trafficking, which uh, were allowed to continually uh, continue to invest in and, and buy homes. So the data has to be there and it has to be in our system, you know, uh, there needs to be a conviction for if we're talking about you know stopping criminals from buying and we need the i would say the political will to to stop those people or or to to really track uh, their funds to family members as well and again i would circle back to what we see in ottawa uh if the government really gets um serious about a serious problem they they can use some pretty big tools so i would leave it at that Mute. Now I'm on. Now I'm on mute. Um, so uh, we're we're nearing the end of our time, and uh, so I wanted to um, leave the panel with one last question. Get people's uh, thoughts on this. As I said at the beginning, we're a research network. We're trying to stimulate new research in housing in Canada, and I wonder if I could hear from everyone. What's what do you think the most important research priority is, and uh, and how can we pursue that? Is is there a role that we can? Uh, we at Check can do to kind of stimulate that kind of research, um, and uh, so. But starting with, you know, what's the most important research priority? Stephen, you look like you're fully loaded and ready to go. Uh, do you mean specifically with respect to money laundering or housing in general? I would say uh, housing and money laundering at, at the intersection of those things. Well, for housing, and I'm going to put my. I was actually a candidate in the federal election in Nova Scotia, and the number one issue I heard at the door was housing, the lack of affordable housing, before climate change, before everything else. And so to me, you know, we've heard a lot from provincial and federal governments about, you know, we need more affordable housing. And, and uh, um, so for me, it's it's research into, you know, innovative models on how we can create more affordable housing, how we can get uh, deal with homeless uh, people. Uh, I think there's some very innovative models out there in other countries. Um, but Canada tends to be a bit of a laggard. We're like five years behind innovation and, and uh, uh, we do a lot of catching up. So it'd be great uh, when I work as a criminologist, I'm always trying to learn about what other countries doing innovatively in, in to deal with crime. And uh, I think we need to do that in the housing. And with respect to money laundering, and again, speaking as a criminologist and similar to what Sam said, we constantly react. We react to problems. We seem to be completely, you know, impotent in anticipating and preventing a problem from manifesting itself in the society. And again, what happened in Ottawa is a perfect example. You know, that's something that should be nipped in the bud before, you know, it came to that. Um, and you know, I work in the field of crime prevention, and really. What you know, we've heard a lot about defund police, and what I've been saying for years is we need to start at the community level, shifting funds away from police to communities, but at the 
a federal level, we need to start putting more money into organized crime enforcement, money laundering enforcement, you know, extremist enforcement. Um, so we need to, sh we have too much policing money at the community level. We have not enough funding at the federal level to tackle the real serious crimes, including corporate crime, quite frankly, which has a far greater impact on society than organized crime. Fantastic. That's really helpful. And uh, and I would agree with you. I think it, we're, you know, Canada is always referred to as the pilot project uh, country and uh, on homelessness. We've got um, an actual randomized trial that was conducted between 2010 and 2013 that shows excellent models for solving homelessness, but we've just failed to implement it. Um, people are now talking about the Finnish models. Well, we'd already done that study. So and I think you're absolutely right on that one. So thanks for that, Stephen. Uh, Mark, uh, I, I think one of the things that uh, that you're focused on is certainly regulation of professions. Is, yeah, is there anything yeah. else beyond that? Um, no, I think I think we need to get deeper into that as well. Uh, I think, uh, you know, listen, sometimes when you conduct interviews with people, uh, different stakeholders, you know, and, and, and there's one statement that that really captured my attention when one somebody in the mortgage industry said my job is to clean money for people. My job is to clean money for for different individuals. Right. So what it is telling me is this. No one is holding you accountable. Right. There is nobody within your industry that is holding you accountable. So for me, yes, more innovation, more granular data on how to hold people within this network accountable. So I'm talking here with notaries, accountants, lawyers, um, mortgage professionals and so on. Terrific. Thank you. Sam, uh, we'll go to you. Yeah, I think, Re research priorities. Uh, just thinking and, and talking at the same time. I mean, I, I would like to see more research on how how big an impact is. We've seen some of this in BC is foreign investment really on markets such as Toronto, Hamilton uh, uh, and, and Vancouver. And, you know, can we delineate between this money I'm talking about that doesn't necessarily have to be criminal, but is money leaving a country and being facilitated by criminal networks. How big of a factor is that in a city like Toronto? We heard a federal liberal MP say we're great at uh, helping uh, foreign investors buy homes in Toronto, not so good at helping people that live in Toronto. So that kind of comment to me, it just triggers the thought that we need more research into how does money from the world affect our cities and, and how does it intersect with fraud or softer crime uh, that that in my view, often connects to more hard crime on in a financial uh, path. Super, thank you. And so Maureen, final word to you on research priorities. Uh, I, I guess I'd like to see what the Cullen Commission comes out with uh, at the outset, because they have uh, commissioned some great reports like Stephen's report. And so I think we'll find a lot more research that will come out of that, that will, I, I think, also lead to more research that needs to be done. And I think certainly, uh, uh, as a federal co uh, country, like like people like the Alberta Minister of Justice, when we put our report out, said the report was rubbish because they didn't have any money laundering in Alberta. So, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean that, that that degree of just sort of denial, and I think just uh, cross pollinating a lot more within the country itself will be helpful too. Because even if one province and, and BC is the province that's taking uh, the most at the moment, if you have one province makes a real dent, all it's going to do is push it to Toronto or Alberta or somewhere else. I mean, we need to sort of take a more cohesive view. And I think looking at research about how we could make that happen or what the levers are to make that happen, uh, maybe working with the federal government would be one way to do it. But again, I, I think the Cullen Commission might lead some, give us some indicators about where we might go with that. So. OK, terrific. Well, I want to sincerely thank our panelists today. This was really, really enlightening and uh, incredibly stimulating. We had a great turnout and a number of different uh, uh, comments, quite extensive comments in the chat that we'll uh, um, be able to follow up on. And I do apologize to those of you who weren't able to ask a question directly. And uh, I want to thank uh, my team at Check for their um, hard work in getting this launched. And I also want to thank the team at CMHC. And in so doing, I'll pass it off to Claire to, to bring us uh, to the end. Thank you again. Thank you again so much, everyone, for joining. I just want to say I put a ton of information in the chat right now. So it was a bit of an overload, but um, I put our email if you would like to contact us, how you would like to join ECHO, um, the speaker's contacts, which will also be 
um, shared in the follow up email that we will send to the attendees. And um, we also have a webinar tomorrow if you're interested in vertical legacy housing. And yeah, that's kind of it. Thank you so much for joining everyone. And I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye now. Thank you very much.